Hi guys and welcome back to the UK's Human Landscape. Today is the last lesson in this unit and we are going to be looking at opportunities for rural areas to rebrand themselves in order to cope with the decline in industrialization or deindustrialization and the decline in agricultural importance. So as I've already said, it is the last lesson of the unit. Next lesson, you can expect an assessment that will be taking the form of a Google quiz. And there will be some questions on there that are longer answer rather than just uh, multiple choice questions. So please do look out for that. Revise, go back through the videos, all the worksheets that we've done. Maybe use Seneca or another program like that. If you haven't subscribed, obviously, please do subscribe. But in addition to that, I'd be really grateful if anybody could give us some feedback. If you're part of my school and you have found this useful, then let us know so that we know to continue doing it. If you are not a member of my school and you are coming across this for the first time, uh, feel free to access all the resources in the folder down below. And of course, please comment to let us know if it's been helpful or if there's anything else you'd like to see. So let's get going. Rural opportunities. So we're going to start off by thinking about what the costs and benefits of deindustrialization in rural areas has been. So we've already said last lesson that uh, a lot of industries in rural areas did end up shutting down. And uh, something that we haven't discussed in as much detail, but is a form of deindustrialization in rural areas, is the decline in agriculture. So if you've got to think about this in the sense of, uh, you know, England's idyllic rolling hills and farming communities, although we still, are, you know, produce a, quite a lot of agricultural products, whether that's wheat or oats or milk or, or eggs or an, and a lot of uh, meat products, although we do still produce loads of those things, uh, we don't need quite as many people to do so. This was a consequence of both the Industrial Revolution and more recent transformations in the technology required to farm. And because it has reduced the number of people required to work in agriculture and farming, uh, the number of jobs that are associated with that has also fallen. And that is problematic for rural communities. In addition, we might think about increased competition from international imports of food. So particularly things like wheat, corn, uh, even some types of meat have suffered from high levels of competition for those same products coming from elsewhere in the world. Now, obviously, some things are um, inevitable. You know, we, we can't grow bananas in the UK, for instance, so you have to import them. But other products uh, have suffered from high levels of competition from imports as well. So there are some real costs to that, as I've already kind of mentioned. I want you to come up with any other costs, particularly thinking about the cycle of economic influence that one thing can have, the impact that it can have, a knock-on impact elsewhere. But also, are there some benefits of deindustrialization? Is the coal and steel industry's decline, does it have some benefits to people? What would you say they are? Pause the video, come up with some ideas, please. So looking at some answers then, we might have uh, costs which we mentioned, like loss of employment. It might lead to the knock-on effect of a decline in other economic activities where people start losing their jobs, they spend less money, they have less disposable income, uh, and that leads to losses of jobs in other industries that are connected, but maybe aren't the one that originally went down, declined. Uh, in addition then, we've got declining income from local government, and this, is a tax issue, okay? So where people are earning less money or there's higher levels of unemployment, the amount of money the government receives from charging people their income taxes is going to go down. And that can sometimes mean that the government has less money to spend, particularly local councils. But there are definitely some benefits. And one of the major ones is a cleaner environment. We might think today of rural areas as being full of fresh air and green space and actually what we forget is that a lot of these places were quite industrial uh, or you know very much about those primary and secondary industries and actually that didn't always you know make create a, cr a clean environment and that sort of image that we have of it now is sort of a, a slightly more modern thing 
Secondly, there are new opportunities for development. Where something has declined, that doesn't mean that there are no opportunities for things to grow or transform into the future. And in particular, partly as a result of a cleaner environment and these new opportunities, there's been a massive increase in the amount of tourism based in the United Kingdom and through that tourism, tertiary employment, so that service sector employment. So looking at Cornwall today, then we're thinking about some of the ways in which an area such as Cornwall could be rebranded. OK, and I want you to think about what it is that is really positive that could really attract people to Cornwall. I want you to think maybe about its culture, the farming, the former industries and in terms of tourism, what things could you really promote? What do they have? They might have lots of space. They have certainly got a long coastline. They've got a long history of, um, you know, in industry and other things. They've got a fantastic food culture. They've got absolutely gorgeous scenery. Come up with a couple of ideas. What would you do if you had to try and rebrand and regenerate an area like Cornwall? Okay, so let's have a look at some ideas. I really hope you went down some of the tourism opportunities, thinking about things like um, camping, uh, holidays. You've got loads of opportunities for sort of walks and, and beautiful natural areas to be promoted in that way. You might have sort of activities like uh, things that you would do from a beach, say it were fishing or sailing or other water sports. You might have hiking and rock climbing and stuff like that in certain areas if we're thinking about industry there's loads of opportunities perhaps in something like organic farming okay really focusing on uh you know the benefits of the you know natural local food that is is being created there so farming organically perhaps food cosmetics drinks industries there's a huge market for that uh Places that used to be farms or are still operating farms but are looking for additional sources of income might, for instance, choose to diversify. That means to try extra things to create extra options. Uh, say, for instance, if you have a bit of woodland, people might start to create places that you could go paintballing. You know, you're sort of going through the, the woods and, and having a paintball game in a particular area. Uh, a lot of farms have farm shops which sell... Uh, the products that they create there, but also products that are produced locally. Um, a lot of farms might have small cafes opening up or other sort of arts-based projects. You can get lots of specialist food products with local identities. So uh, Devon cream is something that people will base their branding on, perhaps particularly like Devonshire ice cream. Uh, Melton Mowbray pork pies have got a uh, special sort of uh, standing that you can only say they're from Melton Mowbray if they actually are because they're considered to be a specialist food from that area. Uh, obviously focusing on the area's history, you could have arts and media projects, there's nothing stopping arts and media really taking advantage of all this beautiful countryside. Um, and some people choose to go to you know farms or rural areas for their tourism itself, things like horse riding courses or clay pigeon shooting, uh, you know um, even just to be able to stay out in the countryside. Uh, so if you had any of these ideas, that's fantastic. This one down here, I want to just draw your attention to developments of rural energy schemes, and in particular, things like hydroelectric power, so using local streams and rivers to generate uh, clean, green energy, uh, solar and wind turbine projects in areas that are not very densely populated, can actually bring some of that energy industry back where coal has previously declined. So I'm going to ask you to do a bit of research. We haven't done this in a little while, but I thought, you know, it might be a slightly different task. Here's a website for a particular farm, which has become also a bed and breakfast. So it's an accommodation. And I'm asking you to think about how a very traditional rural business has had to change some of the things that it does. Now, that's not to say that my farm is no longer a farm. It is a farm. It still has the animals. It still produces a lot of food, but it isn't the only thing that they do anymore. And that's what we mean when we say that they are diversifying in order to increase the number of income streams that they have and help them stay profitable.
So I'm going to ask you to uh, do a bit of research answering these questions, particularly looking at these two websites. So the first one is Mythe Farm and the second one is Mythe Barn Events. And you'll see that they've combined their businesses both for the farm and for some other things as well. I'd like you to have a little look at those websites. I think the second one in particular is really helpful to help answer some of these questions. So if you had a little look on the first link, you can see that they've got all this lovely accommodation. They said that it's available for wedding guests and delegates. So they've turned themselves into a B&B &B, as we've already mentioned. And then they've also got all this stuff about weddings and corporate events. And if we click on this, it will take us to the second link that I gave you. So what you might notice is that they actually have three websites. They've got the one we just looked at. We've got this one, which is for events and things like that. So talking about, you know, wedding events, corporate events, so meetings and things like that, team events. Uh, they've got loads of things on sustainability and the way in which they remain sustainable. Uh, so really capitalizing on the uh, sort of rural location there. Even in the About Us, they're capitalizing a bit here uh, on the history of the area and they've had quite a lot of money given to them by the government to regenerate and restore their historic buildings so actually 2.4 million pounds invested in the spaces that they have um, so that's really interesting and of course they do sort of catering using local produce they've got loads of different events that that they'd happily run um, and they've got a separate whole wedding uh, website sorry for weddings so this one is exactly the same location but now you know really focusing on the whole sort of beautiful instagrammable wedding design um these three websites are all for the same exact place and what it really shows us are some of the ways in which rural uh, locations that you know classic traditional farms have actually changed the types of services that they offer to not just be primary producers of products, but also to be offering those sorts of services. Um, so I hope you came up with some answers to these questions. You know, they've, they've got some very different areas of businesses, particularly profitable ones. If we're thinking about something like weddings, the target age group maybe has changed quite a lot. Uh, and there are definitely some advantages to this. There might be some huge disadvantages, for instance, do people really want to have an outdoor barn wedding in the winter? Or is that something that really people only choose in the summer? Is it still got the problem of being quite seasonal, perhaps, which we discussed last lesson? And this last question I think is really, really important to, to mention. Is this a top down or a bottom up form of a regeneration? And, you know, there's an argument to say that it's both. The top down idea of regeneration is that the government gets you to do it. Perhaps they fund it and it costs quite a lot. And actually, we've seen in this example, they did get quite a lot of money from the government to restore one of their event spaces, which was a barn. But there's also an element of bottom up here. They are really focusing on what they think they can provide to people. And they've done it in their own way, planned by the local people to try and regenerate, um, you know, and increase their income. So a really interesting case study. Our second case study then today is a much bigger project than, uh, you know, the sort of bottom up rural diversification. This project is called the Eden Project, and it does look a little bit like something out of a sci fi movie. So the Eden Project is in Sign Austell in Cornwall. And what they did was they took what was a big pit a big hole in the ground where there had been a former clay mine where we'd been digging up the ground. And they turned this sort of scar in the landscape, this horrible area, into somewhere that could house these biomes. Now, that word biome you haven't heard in a little while, and that's because normally we talk about biomes on a global level. Say, for example, if we were to talk about desert biomes, we're talking about them occurring at about 30 degrees north and south of the equator. They're areas uh, which have very low precipitation. And in those um, instances of a hot, dry desert biome, we're talking about ones 
that are quite close to the equator. Now, these bubbles, these sort of uh, plasticky bubbles, were created to house completely different biomes in them. So what they have in there is an educational center. They also have event spaces. So if you did want to host your wedding or something like that, you can do that. But they're also an area for study because they host plants and sort of create false environments for loads of different biomes. So if you go there, you can actually walk through a tropical rainforest or you can walk through a desert biome and experience what those are like and how different they are. Now, uh, Eden, the Eden Project is celebrating the fact that it has been uh, going for many, many years now. It opened in 2001, so this is almost 20 years old, this project. And between 2001 and 2009, it had managed to contribute a whole one billion pounds to the Cornish economy. And this influx of money is enormous. It creates loads of jobs. It has knock-on impacts, as we've discussed, as more people, uh, you know, have more disposable income in this area created by the Eden Project, that creates a knock-on effect in the rest of the economy. Now, that figure of one billion pounds doesn't even include the amount of money that visitors who go to the Eden Project spend when they go there. But it does include the amount of um, money that they spend elsewhere in Cornwall. So say, for example, you go on holiday to Cornwall and you're going to go to the Eden Project for maybe a day, maybe two potentially. But you're also going to go to other local businesses. You're going to go to the beaches. You're going to go to the restaurants. You've got to find somewhere to stay. So you've got to pay for some accommodation. And all of those other industries really benefit from the Eden Project as well, all around that region. So what I'm going to ask you to do is to watch this video. And while you're watching this video, you don't have to go the whole way through. I think you have to go to about the end of the fourth minute or so. I want you to brainstorm some of the benefits that the projects like this can bring to a deprived area. OK, and why was that needed in Cornwall? Casting your mind back to last lesson. Now, the other thing I want you to do while you're you know, thinking about some of the benefits of this project, I want you to think about whether or not this is a top down or a bottom up development. Would the people of Cornwall be able to come up with this all by themselves without support from the national government? Probably not. OK, so this is very much a top down project for regenerating this rural area. Pause the video, watch, sorry, pause my video, watch this video and brainstorm the benefits of a project like this. Off you go. So what we're going to do now is we're going to look a little bit at the textbook just to get a little bit more information about these projects. OK, both thinking about farm um, and the uh, Eden project as well. And I want you to compare, complete a table, sorry, which is part of your uh, worksheet, just comparing the benefits and uh, the costs. So when we say benefits and costs, we're kind of also saying advantages and disadvantages. Okay, so if you're a bit confused by that, I want to know the good things and the bad things. Good things are benefits, bad things are costs. Bearing in mind, costs can be financial, which is how we normally think of them as to do with money, but they can also be a social cost or an environmental cost. So we're really just saying things that we lose or things that are negative um, impacts. So doing a little table, then I want you to decide for yourself, and there's no correct answer to question two, which of these projects would you argue has had the greatest benefits for the local economy? Is it, um, you know, the farm regeneration? Is it the Eden project? Is it the third project? And then finally, under question four, I want you to give me two reasons why projects like this are needed to diversify the economy of rural areas. Off you go. OK, sorry, if you didn't do that task, I'm going to just show you how you can do it. You All you have to do to get to that task is click this link. And the link will literally take you to Caboodle. Oh. You put in your email address. Oh. And password. And then it will take you straight to the page now. OK, so... 
new thing, direct links. You don't have to faff about trying to find the page really quick, okay? If you didn't do it before, now you've got a chance to answer my questions. Okay, so looking at some answers then, we have got things like the Eden Project, which has got a range of attractions, loads of different stuff going on there. It's open all year round because it's covered. You could go there any time of the year. And as we know, it's been really successful. A billion pounds generated in just nine years. Uh, it, of course, this figure is slightly out of date because they're going to have generated even more than that since then. Um, and they say that they've created 700 jobs directly and 3,000 jobs indirectly. And again, that indirect job creation is things like local hotels, local restaurants, being able to hire more people because they have more customers that are coming from the Eden Project. But some major disadvantages, some costs as well. Traffic congestion has gone up because, of course, lots of people driving to the same exact place is going to increase traffic congestion. And as we've seen in a previous lesson, Cornwall doesn't have the greatest road links. Uh, there aren't very many motorways that go uh, to Cornwall itself. And even the motorway that does go there sort of ends very, very close to the border. And then it's just A roads from there. So they're quite small roads. Uh, and 97% of people who visit the Eden Project actually do come by car. So it's not even like, you know, they're getting trains and, and cycling and stuff like that. Also, the number of visitors is has been falling. Although I think that following the 2012 financial crisis, uh, the number of visitors actually went up because more people chose to stay and have holidays in the United Kingdom rather than going elsewhere. We might even see that again following the coronavirus where people are not able to go abroad on their summer holidays if they can afford to do that, but instead choose to stay here in the United Kingdom and explore some of those different things. Now, the example of the farm shop here is similar but not the exact same shop as the one we looked at in our research earlier and they do loads of really positive things they've got a low carbon footprint they're quite sustainable they sell lots of local produce um, so that's foods that have been grown or created locally they promote their environmental values and they have a positive impact on the surrounding area again the shop itself is open all year round but it's a pretty small scale project. It's only employing eight people. So you'd probably need a lot of farm shops to have the same impact as something like the Eden Project. Finally then, we've got our tourist accommodation and it definitely brings in quite a bit more money. The tourist accommodation is a good money spinner, but barn conversions have an unexpected consequence or at least unexpected for me as a city dweller, of um, actually reducing the amount of space for nesting birds. So in a weird way, it's bad for the environment to be turning all of these old rickety barns that animals used to use as nesting spaces or birds used to use as nesting spaces into sort of fancy accommodation because it pushes them out. Um, and of course, farming generally is quite, you know, a negative thing for the biodiversity of an area because it forces a monoculture. So mono meaning one, a monoculture would be where you only have one type of plant. Well, that's what we do on a farm. You deliberately say, here is a field and I'm going to put lots and lots of wheat plants in it. Or here is a field and I'm going to put lots of cows on it. Now, you don't tend to mix up lots of different plants or animals and that can create problems for the natural environment as well. It's one of the reasons that the loss of hedgerows, for instance, is a devastating thing for many rural areas, particularly in terms of nesting spaces again, but for a lot of different creatures. So our final question then was about two reasons why projects are needed to diversify the economy of rural areas. We just break down that question again. We want two reasons specific why projects are needed to diversify the economy of rural areas. Now, this word diversify is really important because what we don't want to talk about is the things that they've done before. We don't want to talk about the traditional rural occupations. We want to talk about the things that are maybe a bit different, that are giving it um, alternative income sources. So and in our answers, then, we might want to look at some of the 
benefits of diversification or we might want to talk about the disadvantages of not being diversified so for example relying on one industry can result in mass unemployment if the industry collapses and we talked about this last lesson with the coal mines when the coal mines collapsed in cornwall and stopped being productive and thousands of people lost their jobs uh, in this case in this example for some reason the china clay industry not just uh, coal if an area relies on tourism, which is seasonal, that can actually be a disadvantage. OK, so if you're just getting tourists in the summer season, you actually need to have some income the rest of the year. So you, it might be worthwhile investing in things that can be used all year round. So something like the Eden Project, the farm shops or an indoor wedding venue can be used in the winter months. And finally, then. You know, low incomes mean that lots of people are living in relative poverty. We watched that really moving video last lesson about the fact that despite Cornwall's beautiful environment, people don't expect to see that level of poverty that we really do find there. It's amongst one of the most deprived areas in the United Kingdom. So we almost sort of stereotypically expect, you know, urban areas to have you know, real poverty sections in them, areas that are really, really deprived. But we don't always expect to see it in such a beautiful landscape. And the reality is that that does happen. So low incomes mean that lots of people are living in relative poverty. And especially if their jobs aren't secure, particularly if it's harvesting at farm work or seasonal work in the summer. And that also means that they're unable to afford a mortgage or to buy their own home. And we talked again last lesson about the challenge of rising house prices because tourists choose to buy a second home. So lots of reasons there why we need to diversify the economy. What you might notice about this question is in our answer, we didn't talk about how you diversify. We didn't mention what we would do instead. We're talking about the reason why we need to have alternatives yeah okay guys overall then what do you think is the biggest challenge and the biggest opportunity facing cornwall what would you say they are based on last lesson and today's lesson because this is pretty much the end of the unit so guys thank you so much for participating in this course i hope that the videos are really helpful to you i hope that the resources that are in the link below are helpful to you uh, and of course please do subscribe for more lessons our next unit coming up is consuming energy resources see you there